Welcome to the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast, brought to you by Kraus Health, the official partner of Syracuse Athletics, providing the latest technology and expertise in the treatment of stroke and cardiac emergencies. I'm Mike Waters. Today on the podcast, I'm joined by former Syracuse basketball player Roosevelt Bowie. I talked with Roosevelt about his love for fishing, his thoughts on this year's Syracuse team, and his connection with current Syracuse center Jesse Edwards. Today, our guest is uh, should be a familiar face to most Syracuse fans out there and definitely a familiar sounding voice uh, because there's no mistaking it when Roosevelt Bowie is in the house. Roosevelt, how are you? I'm doing excellent, Mike. You know, you're one of my favorite. Uh, you actually, you're in the top position as my uh, favorite journalist. After uh, fantasy camp, when you went out there and took a charge against the freight train, and rolled about three blocks. When you got up, you're number one now. Uh, we're just all glad I actually got up. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, there, there's still pieces of skin on the Carmelo Anthony <laughs> basketball practice floor up there. It belongs to me. We're like, take the charge, Mike. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know there was a bunch of former players acting as coaches and counselors at that camp who got a real kick out of the sports writer uh, taking part. And some of them had fun at, with me. Uh, Derek, uh, Derek Coleman, had he, he took some sick pleasure in, in, in killing me in practice. Oh, it was it was that it was worth its weight in gold. I don't know about the if the campers enjoyed it as much as as much as we did. We were out there doing the coaching thing. Then we just laugh the whole time. Everybody starts telling coach stories, and you know everybody's got one. And there's probably there's probably thirty of us there, so you can imagine. Oh yeah, I I tried to be a fly on the wall for those uh, two or three days for some of those stories. Uh, I remember one time you guys were having breakfast, and I kind of tried to sneak in there with the group. And uh, uh, Herman Harid was telling stories, and Billy Owens was telling stories. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, before we really get going here, I, I know some folks will listen to this on various platforms, but some can actually watch it on YouTube, and they can't help but notice that the of your background there, it is the beautiful shores of Lake Ontario, and that's, actually, you live there. Actually, yes, actually, so you're actually looking west, and... uh that's actually the entrance to Bald Eagle Marina. It's about 300 yards from my house down there. But And I caught the lake flat as it never is. It's like twice a year it's that flat. And I took the picture and I used it for my background. It helps me to remember what's coming as soon as the weather gets warm again. <laughs> Keep those memories alive. Um, now, you like to fish those waters, right? You, you, uh, you're an avid fisherman. Yes. Uh, a lot of people, I don't know. If then no, I started playing basketball when I was 14. I started fishing when I was six. And I I never brag about my basketball ability, but uh, if there's fish in the water, I can get it out <laughs> easily. So what what fish do you go for during what uh, seasons of the year up there? Well, I'm uh, I like panfish or so like uh, sunfish. But sunfish, anybody can catch sunfish to like blue, blue, you're like that big. I like to go after the big ones. They're a lot smarter. They're a lot trickier. So you got to got to be a little craftier to get them. They taste fantastic. I also love perch, walleye. Um, I go for the occasional salmon when the weather's when the weather's right. But the, the beauty of the whole matter is uh, uh, November 1st, I just uh, started the Bowie Foundation. And I'm going to be teaching underprivileged kids to fish. That's fantastic. You just started it. We just started. I did. So what I did first is I went out with a friend of mine, Guy Crump. He's a professional fisherman. And we started going out and he introduced me to some people. I said, you got to put together a program. Everybody has great ideas. You have to put it in writing. So it took me about a year and a half to put it down. So we kind of to put it very, very plainly. Um, we did like a college course. So fishing 101 is fishing with live bait from the shore. Fishing 201 is for those who don't like live bait, they can use artificial fishing from the shore. 301 
is fishing as a passenger on a boat, learning how a little bit about the grabs, how to fish from, from a boat, be a passenger, uh, learn about safety on the water. And 401 is we teach you how to launch the boat, drive the boat, read the graphs. And you can choose when you're on the boat, you can choose whichever you like, live bait or, or artificial. And then you, the, the 501 class is you can either decide to be a professional fisherman and we'll point you down that, that road, or you can go back and become a mentor in the program. And the beauty of the whole thing is in the beginning, we try to work with groups of 20 to 25 kids. Um, I've talked to the Boys and Girls Club of Syracuse. I've talked to uh, YMCA in Medina. They're all excited about the program because we pick up um, those 25 kids. We split them up into four groups. And one day you'll be doing classroom work, learning about fishing and, and bait and how to do it properly. And one of the days I teach them how to go out and identify an older boat, a used boat. And we, we, we bring it back. You no, know, I've been I've had three boats donated to me. They're just they're, they're deep V aluminum boats, 17, 18 foot. And then we take them apart and we fix them and we show them, you know, that you can make a nice boat out of it. And um, then I have my friend uh, Tom Ewing that does Ewing, Ewing graphics. He does uh, the size of the Wegmans trucks, all the graphics on the side of the truck. Then he takes it and he gives me a he makes he prints out some fantastic vinyl and puts it on the sides of the boat. So we really upgrade these boats and uh, put the carpeting in and everything. And at the end of the, and at the end of the program, that group gets the boat that they work on and they finish. Oh, that'll be wonderful. Uh, what a great experience from uh, basically soup to nuts, uh, the whole fishing experience. Now tell me this, who, who was the first person to put a fishing pole in your hands? Who taught you to fish? And it was my grandmother, Rose Henderson. My grandmother was uh, about five feet tall, and she was, I think she's half Cherokee, which uh, which I realize now because of all the home home remedies that we had to take growing up. Uh, yeah, she was the first to actually put put a rod in my hand, and I was, as a, as a child, I was a little busy. I wasn't a bad kid, but I was always busy and doing things. And so I used to get, you know, they, uh, Roosevelt, what are you doing? So after, after a while, so I went out with them one day fishing and I started catching fish and she said, oh, look what my baby did. And it was like, a, she was praising me. And I was like, man, that's a whole lot better than getting yelled at for doing something messed up. So then I started focusing on, I like that. So I catch fish. And by the time I was nine years old, I'd get up in the morning before dawn and I, and I, every, and I was trusted to go out. I'd take my fishing pole and I'd my dog and we'd go out and I'd come back at the end of the day. I'd have a bucket full of fish to the point where she would go to church on Sunday and then trade like, cause in the city they didn't shoot the church in the city. They didn't have access to fresh fish. Like we did. I would catch buckets of fish. Once I started getting, get you know, figuring out what I was doing and she would trade them for a bushel of apples or she trade them for vegetables. And, and I, and then I started feeling all responsible. So you got this little skinny kid walking around with a fishing pole and I'm actually, I could feed a family of five during the summer. I mean, I catch that many fish, they would just trade them off. And then I, and then it gave me responsibility. And then I stopped being busy and getting in trouble. And, and I, then I turned about 14 and I was still going off fishing. And I noticed this guy shooting baskets and I walked by the gym, he made a basket and I could have swore I heard, oh, ah! and I stopped and I looked and I, then I got the first chance I got to go to the gym. I go in there and, uh, I'm in there half an hour. I make two baskets. <laughs> but when I made those two baskets, man, did that feel good. And at that point I was lost. I started, you know, my focus was, was, uh, elsewhere, but, uh, fishing has always been in the back of my mind. So I, what my fishing buddies are guy rough who played football at Syracuse and our month. We, oh, uh, wow. we, wow. Are, we, we have this ongoing thing. We, we all swear that we're better fishermen than we ever were, uh, athletes. First of all, um, I mean, there, there are stories. About, uh, also, so when I, when I was at Syracuse, the football team, we were always hungry all the time. And Art and Brian Ishman lived, always lived within sight of my back window because whenever I would go out fishing, I'd come back home. As soon as I turned the light on, they'd run down the hill, knock on the back window, come in and take out. You know, they're like, listen, we, we can, we're going to have the, the funniest things. We, so Art and Brian say, listen, we can cook fish, you know, Will, you bring the fish 
and we'll bring we'll, we'll we'll have everything left to go with the fish. I was like, okay, so I I drop off. Oh, they had to be like twenty five pound of fish. We had them all filleted out and everything. And I so I go away. I get all dressed up. I come back. I get into their little apartment. Their little apartment was on Harrison, just uh, just before, uh, right at the end of uh, uh, what is it? The the, the where the fraternity row is down there uh, by sure. the by the library. So they used to be in that that apartment right there. I get there, park my car, I come in. You know what we have for dinner? Just fish, fish and Kool Aid. <laughs> 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 they gave me they gave me this they called it a garbage can it was a big it's like a, a 32 ounce cup but it was the best grape kool-aid that i ever had in my entire life even had little 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 orange little orange on the side of the glass and i just looked at them i was like you guys are you guys are no good but that was the best fish that we ever had those they, so those are my those are my buddies back then and we fished on oh up until probably five uh four or five years ago we'd cut we'd get together and we'd fish and uh yeah it was that was that was my way to that was my way to get through uh playing in another country we i'd make my phone calls with guy and i'd say listen where, where are we going to fish so we start making our calls back and forth like in january february and then uh, i would literally fly into the states drop my stuff off at my mom's house get back on a plane and, and meet guy wherever we decided to go but normally it was around here so there's some great fishing around here Okay, so you, you grew up in Kendall, New York. You go to Syracuse University, but you did, like you just alluded to, you spent your entire professional basketball career, 12 or 13 years of it overseas. Yes. Did you ever fish in Europe? I did. I, yeah. I fished. Uh, so I went, uh, well, there's, there are a lot of fishermen in Europe, but in Europe, there uh, are they're more fishermen per square kilometer than anywhere in the world. The only problem is they keep what they catch, everything. So there's very limited places to fish. So I would go up into the – so I'd take about an hour and a half trip up into the mountains. Matter of fact, I played with Lewis Orr for four months. I even took him up there fishing. I got a, some I got some pictures I'll show you at some point. Where we're, set, we're up at a mountain. It's just a, a, a mountain place where they would go up and walk around this this pristine lake. And they were there were trout. They would they would uh, they put trout in this lake, and I would just go up there and I test out my techniques up there. But mostly it was just to get away and and, and, and take a breather. I fished in Spain. I fished in Switzerland. Um, where else I fished? And actually, I went on. Uh, I, I took a vacation to Scotland. I went there and I fished in Scotland. Where else did I fish? Uh, I went to lucky. It's so amazing. Yeah. So I, where I, was I, the I didn't best get... fishing? Where was the uh, best? The best, the best fishing, and that right there, behind you, Lake Ontario. Lake Ontario, because guy for for probably seven years, we start researching the biggest fish, the best, the, the most, the most variety of fish, and we came here every, we came here like five years in a row because we have the most variety, the biggest fish, the, I mean, I looked at, I looked at Alaska, they're 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 pretty good, they're equal, but. You had to compete with that hairy other guy, you know, the the bears that like when they see you fishing, they've come to the conclusion that when they see a man with a fishing pole, that there's going to be free fish at the end of the. And and sometimes they don't really want to wait for you to give them the fish. So they want to come out and like take it from you. So I decided, guy, we can fish near my house and we don't have to fight off the bears to get back to the shore. So a matter of fact, um, if you right, if going straight behind me west. About ten or eleven miles is Point Breeze, which uh, I think two or three years ago was voted as Fish Town USA. It's a little, it's a little small place, but people come from all over the country to fish for to go up um, Oak Orchard River and to fish for the salmon steel. Uh, we have a uh, steelhead salmon, lake trout. Um, I so my record for steel, my biggest steelhead is about fourteen pounds. Biggest rainbows, 12 pounds. My biggest salmon is 42 pounds. Oh my I, caught God. A, I, caught, I, caught a, I caught a male salmon, 42 pounds. That same night, I caught two female salmon, 130 pounds and 133 pounds. It's, uh, it's, it's mind-boggling. And, and so when I would bring these fish home, so my, so my sisters came and they're like, where did you catch those fish? And I said, in the lake. Because when the lake gets like that, we'd go out there and we'd swim and splash around in it. 
my sisters haven't been out in the water since I brought them the first pitch of the fish. They said, those fish are out there in the lake because a 42 pound, a 42 pound salmon has teeth like a medium sized dog. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and to be quite honest with you, I kept the two female and I put the I put the male back. So the male's the male's tail was the size of my hands like this. And it was about that big around. So because, you know, you got to revive them before you put them back because they fight so hard. If you just put them back in the water, they'll die. You can't swim. So you got to put them back in. You got to kneel down. You got to push them back and forth. And the thank you that they give you is they do that swish with their tail where about a bucket and a half of water goes right all over you. And, uh, but that, but that's it. But that's the kind of fishing that we have around here. And I've talked to Derek, Derek, uh, Derek Coleman, uh, Billy Owens. First, Derek, I told him that I'd invited him down here for a fishing derby that I was, uh, that I set up. And, uh, and, uh, and Derek, Derek goes, yeah, yeah. He, he goes, yeah, I'll go fishing. And Billy goes, what do you know about fishing? You're from the city. He's like, no, nah, Rosie knows I'm from, I'm from down south. We all know how to fish. So we had this whole thing going on. And it was a year that we had really high water. I, I found five charter captains that were going to that would donate their time for all of us to come out and fish. So uh, who ended up coming was Dale Shackelford, Dennis Duval, and his family, and my family. And so we went out there. We had an absolute fabulous time. But we're going to do it again this year. Um, we're organizing a, a little event just for. Uh, um, it's going to be. It, it, I'm trying to. I don't know what it's going to be for, but I know I want to get these guys together because you saw how much fun we have when we're all together at, at the camp. So yes. just when we all get together, Come it's on. a lot of fun. So it's going to be this year coming up. Well, you're listening to the Inside Basketball, uh, Inside Syracuse Basketball podcast here with uh, part-time basketball player and avid fisherman, Roosevelt Bowie. <laughs> um, the podcast is brought to you by Krause Health, providing the latest technology and expertise in the treatment of stroke and cardiac emergencies. Okay, back to Roosevelt. Well, that that's fascinating stuff about fishing. And, you know, I knew a little bit about your passion for it because we've talked a little bit in the past. And also, if you follow you, to follow you on Facebook is to follow a, a guy who cares about fishing. When I'm Especially in the spring and summer, I'm, I'm always seeing your photos and generally jealous uh, of, of what you're doing. Um, but let's turn to basketball for a little bit. All right. Yes, the sport where most Syracuse basketball fans know you for. Um, you know, they, most fans know their story of coming out of Kendall, uh, coming to Syracuse. Um, but I've always loved the story about how you played a integral role in Jim Beheim getting the head coaching job at Syracuse, where he was being considered for the job after being an assistant to Roy Danforth and Roy right. leaves for Tulane. And as they're considering other folks too, Jim makes no bones about it to that committee that, listen, you get me, I'm getting Roosevelt Bowie. You don't take me. Now, did, were you very aware of what was going on there, of, of your role in that whole situation? No. No. No, what, no I wasn't. I knew, I knew nothing about it. But I wanted, I was looking at St. Bonaventure. And Syracuse. I didn't want to look at St. Bonaventure. I did, I never visited Syracuse, but I came to basketball camp here at, at Syracuse. And when I was at basketball camp, Coach Beheim was like, he knew basketball. Like it, five, ten minutes, you could tell. Just talk to him. He knew. He knew. He really knew basketball. I was like, oh man. And I was looking for the character of the um of the coaches. So at a, at a young age, I knew that I wanted to have a coach that had similar characteristics to my dad. My dad was, I don't think I heard him say like 10 words in a row. And Coach Beheim, when he was first coaching, he'd come in and he goes, uh, Rosie, um, rebound pretty good. Um, I like these block shots. Uh, and you're working on your offense. So just keep doing it. That that was my, that was our talk after, after the, before the season, after the season. Like <laughs> that was it. He would say, A, B, C, what we need you to do. Uh, and then next year, like to work on, you know, the defense is good. Work on your offense, you know. Learn, keep plugging that middle. I was like, okay, I leave. That's what I, what I work on. I said, what easier? So those were the things that, that he said. So I see him at camp. He comes in one day. He's got on a polo and some plaid colored shorts and evidently just came back from golfing. And he was had on a pair of $50 Converse, leather Converse. They just made the Converse into leather, the Chuck Taylors. 
And he comes walking into the gym, and I look at him. He's got those little short socks, and he's walking on the back of these shoes. They're like slippers. And he walk, he walks in. I was like, man, that dude's laid back. I could do that. That's something my dad would do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it it was, you know, it, it, and, my, and back then, Coach Beham never yelled. He would he'd tell us what he wants to do. He'd say it. Well, not, not at us. He would yell at the refs and everything, but he would never yell at us. Like my, my dad, my dad was like, He'd say, hey, this is what I need you to do, plain and simple. There was no discussion. So that's what I was That's what I was looking for, that, that type of personality. Because I knew that at a young age that if I went with a coach that yelled and screamed a lot, it's not something that I'm used to. I know I, I, my parents raised me right, but I know that bad day when I get up in the morning, stub my toe, and I go to practice, and that coach is a Bobby Knight type coach is, ah, Oof, man. I like that gentle giant thing, but everybody knows when you have that bad day. I didn't want to take the risk of jeopardizing my my career, so I said, "I know if I if I have somebody that has similar similar characteristics, and should he yell at me, I would be more docile because I, it's I would be thinking like, okay, I did something wrong, so I got to I got to do better." So that was my whole thinking, and then I came. Uh, it makes me seem like a genius when I pick my coaches, but so I go down to I'm looking at. St. Bonaventure, Syracuse. They they have similar type players, but the key was they didn't have a center. I wanted to play right away. I wasn't going to a school with a center. My mother didn't raise a fool, so I was looking around. I want a school, no center. And uh and I and so I sit down with Coach Reynolds, who was my high school coach, and I say to him, uh, you know, I, I really like Syracuse, but you know, Coach Reynolds is uh I mean uh, coach Coach Benham is not the head coach. Now, Coach Danforth was no, I had no problem with Coach Danforth except I was a country boy. Every time I saw him, he had on a three piece suit, a real cream comb over, and uh, a fast talker. And, I, and I, so, in my mind, I just it reminded me of a city slicker. <laughs> now, mind you, he'd never done or said anything to me. It was my, my first, it was, that was just my impression. And then when I see Coach Beheim, was like, slow talking, hey, you know, I was like, okay, that, that's good. But I said, but darn, he's not the head coach. So, and I said this to my coach Reynolds, I said, you know, that's going to be a tough choice for me. And I, I came to school one day, I think it was a Wednesday and coach Reynolds was at the, I got off the bus, coach Reynolds was standing there with the newspaper and he said, I walked in there, he goes, your buddy's the head coach of Syracuse University. We walked right through the school. I called coach Beheim and on Wednesday he came out on Thursday and I signed. Wow. But I knew nothing about the whole – I found out about that ordeal because I was golfing with Steve Shaw, who was on the board at that time. And he said, man, Coach Beham walked in here and he said he was going to do this. And if you don't and if you don't come with me, I'm going to go to Rochester and I'm going to take them there. <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like, really? But I, I kept thinking that possibly he may have, he may have had a conversation with, with my coach and, I, and understood that. I, I really wanted to go there if he was if he was a head coach, but he, he wasn't. I'm beginning to think that they may have had a little chit chat because as soon as I got off the bus, he's standing there with the paper. We walked straight through the school into the basketball office, and we called down here at Syracuse, and, uh, and it was all over. It made me look like I was like a genius for waiting and picking the rights. Yeah, it was just that simple. Well, and then from there. You got exactly what you wanted out of the deal. You started right away. You were the you were the center coming in as a freshman. You played four years, over fifteen hundred career points, almost one thousand rebounds, and over yeah. three hundred block shots. You're still number two on the all time list for block shots behind a uh, Ton Thomas. You know when I found out that I was, you know when I found out I was number that I was number two. Okay. I I found I found out that I was number one when. Etan broke the record <laughs> 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 because I'd been out of the country for 16 years and I came back home and they're like, oh, this guy. Uh, and then I, I liked the way Etan played and everything is like, oh, I broke your shot block record. I was like, what, what record? <laughs> <laughs> the last thing that I knew about a shot block record, I think I had the, the, the single season. My freshman year, I had a lot of block shots, but I noticed the next year, 
guy, I would I would catch guys that get up there and they would jump up with the ball and come down with it in their hands and tell me, you're not blocking my shot. Just get to travel and hand it to the ref. I'm like, I wonder does that count as a, as a that should count as a block. <laughs> but yeah, it was, uh, it was, and it, the, the reason the, the, you'll never guess why I started blocking shots because I didn't, I didn't really block a lot of shots when I was in high school. Uh, so I, sophomore, junior year, I didn't really block a lot of shots. If you, you know, if, if you got, if you came right at me, I would, but I didn't really look for it. I came home, my mother, I came home after the game that she watched. And uh, the other team had this uh, really, really quick guard. And he would come to the basket. And he was, you know, and he put those shots up there. And my mother just, she came in when I walked in. So I put my bag down and she goes, baby, it seems to me when those little guys come to the basket and they throw the ball up, that you could just put your hand up and just bat it away. And I, and I stopped. And I thought, and I was like, yeah, I could do that. And, <laughs> and you then, were really new to the game, weren't you? <laughs> I, listen, I, I played it because my cousins all my cousins were playing. My my cousin Aaron is in the, the Robert Swiston Hall of Fame, six four center. He could put a coin on the top of the backboard. He was a freak of nature. He was a uh, also the goalie for the soccer team. And then my cousin Nate, who uh, at six six, they say they they people say they had a thirty eight inch vertical. I want to explain one thing to you. I came back home one year from from Italy. And we played against the WDKX All-Stars, which were some guys in the city of Rochester. We were playing at the North Street Center. So I got in a little late, and there was Emmanuel Bowie, Nate Bowie, Aaron Bowie, myself, and one of my friends, I believe, Ronnie Betts. So so I got there. I said, listen, I can't play. I've got to stretch. So Nate goes, I'll go in. You, you know, you stretch. So I'm sitting under the far basket, and I'm I'm just stretching. So uh, – Nate is 6'6". He has his herky-jerky handle, but he could really handle the ball. But he was playing as a 6'2 guy. So I'm looking down there, and this 6'2 guy picks him. He's going he's going north. The guy picks him. He's going south, separate directions. The guy gets to half court, slows down, and looks over his shoulder. And Nate starts running, starts coming at him. Nate was a soccer player also. He reminded me so much of Randy Smith's build. He comes down. Guy gets right to the basket, and he tries to throw one of those teardrop shots so he just looks over so the waits for him throws the ball up and nate runs down and he's running as fast as he can he throws the shot up nate jumps up and blocks the ball back to half court okay you know how crazy that is? how hard he blocks the ball back to half he so he catches the ball he was he was so high he so he catches the ball he turns, he blocks it back to half court. He ducks down, hits his shoulder blade on the on the on the, the bottom of the backboard. Hits hits the backboard, the backboard's shaking, and but he's still going. He lands 15 feet out of bounds, does the Ollie shuffle and runs back up the court. And I went, I was like, dude, I could read Nike under your feet when you went past. <laughs> <laughs> so, so those are the guys that I was playing with, and and we, you know, uh, Aaron Aaron was a, a big factor. He's a big per. He said nobody nobody ever outworked him. He was a six four center. So in my child's mind at age fourteen, I said, huh, if if I can work as hard as he as, as he does, I'm seven feet tall. I should be a better player. That was my child's psychology. And oh by the way, I am seven feet tall. But back in the day, it wasn't cool to be seven feet. If you said seven foot, you're like lurch, a big thing, big, you know. <laughs> so I always said that I was so my actual height is six eleven and three quarters barefoot. But thanks to Nike Air, I'm over seven feet tall because <laughs> nobody plays ball barefoot. At least I don't, not my family. But that's how it all that's all how it all got started. That's how I got introduced to the game of basketball. We were so competitive, Mike. We used to walking down the street. So my cousin, 6'6", he had the incredible vertical. My vertical is probably 37, 38 inches, but I can reach 9 feet, 3 inches flat-footed. I've got a 7 foot, 6 inch wingspan. God. But we used to do stuff like, we, you know, the, the old cars, the hood of an old Cadillac, we'd be walking down the road, and my cousin would go, he'd go, uh, I bet you can't jump over that. And I was like, you, I said, if you do it, I'll do it. We'd stand next to the car about this far away from the car, feet together, because it didn't count if you got a step. 
You got to stand with your feet together and just jump up, over, and put your feet down and land on the other side of the car. Mike, if we, he would, so he did it, I do it. If we just hit our heel on the car, we'd face plant in the street. We would have never heard of either one of us. That's a, <laughs> that's the stuff that we used to do. So walking down the hall in the school in Kendall, the ceilings are nine feet tall and they have the drop ceilings. Yeah. With the big, with the big things on there. What we used to do in classroom between classes, he would jump up and push a tile out and I would with his head and I would jump up and put it back with mine. That <laughs> so everything was everything was a, everything was a competition, you know. And our teachers, you know, they were the greatest thing about Kendall was our. So the district principal and the principal lived three houses from the school. My my, my, my math, the math teacher lived uh, down the street. Um, I mean, everybody knew us, and everybody also knew my mother. When we when first came to school, my mother brought me in, all five foot three and a half inches, a hundred and 18 pounds she brought us in and she told it because i transferred from I, I used to live in holly until i was age 13 they sold the house that we were in we were renting so i had to move so i moved basically six miles away to kendall so when we so when i came to kendall now the people in holly are still angry they, they said that i left i was like no the guy sold the house that we were in so i had to leave <laughs> so when I come to school, so normally at age 13, you think it's kind of crazy to, to, to move and you'd be all traumatized. But my, I had like 15 cousins that lived in Kendall that I would see like once a year, or once every two years, all of a sudden I'm seeing them every day. So I come in here and I see, I, so I see my cousins in my, uh, so they, so they walked up to me they're like, Hey, what's happening? And I was like, uh, I'm fine. How are you? And they're like, why do you talk so funny? I'm like, pardon <laughs> and i was like <laughs> <laughs> so what happened with my grandmother she said there will be no slang spoken in my house so we spoke precise english she said uh, and i'll never forget there it was uh martin luther king's birthday was not a holiday national holiday yet so i'm on the i'm on the bus and there's probably a grand total of six black kids that went to school in holly so we're on the bus going home and everybody's like yeah, no black kids going to school tomorrow because it's Martin Luther King's birthday. So I get home. I'm like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a parrot. I get home. Yeah, Grandma, no black kids going to school tomorrow because it's Martin Luther King's birthday. My grandmother said, no black kids except you guys. And I said, what's for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> because you you didn't argue with Grandma. She said, she said we're going to school, we're going to school. Now, and was then this later, Grandma said, Rose who taught you to fish? Yes. Okay. And so then she says to me, she goes, who do you think they will have more respect for? Someone that skips school and wears their pants hanging off their butts and their hats on backwards, or someone with a with a, with a degree that can speak to them properly. And I went, point taken. Now she didn't always explain herself, but this time she took the time to do that. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. That's her. That that's how I ended up coming to Kendall. Uh, we've been on here for quite a while, and we're kind of getting near to the end. But I I, I have to ask you a couple things. One is. Syracuse has uh, got a starting center now in Jesse Edwards, who also came to the game of basketball rather late, relatively similar to you. All his, for him, it was because he grew up in the Netherlands. And I know you kind of have a special relationship with Jesse. And I wonder if you could kind of take me through how that developed and and just uh, tell me a little bit about you know, your relationship with, with the kid. Well, it, uh, it started. So Syracuse went to Italy. And uh, to, they did this tour. They went to Italy, and uh, I sent a little. I found out they were going to Italy, and I sent a note to Julie. And I was like, "I'm so traumatized. No one asked me to go." <laughs> and then I got, and the coach made it made a, made something funny. He said, "Well, you know who to send the note to." So then I I ended up getting an invitation. I went over and I traveled with the kids. So that's when I met Jesse's Jesse's mom and dad, uh, Simone and David, and I and I talked with them and. And I, I liked him because I was I always watched young kids when they first when they're playing without any rules over there they were playing without any they're just playing basketball, and I watched what they do then because eventually they're gonna have to learn how to do all the stuff that the, the, the zone and the defense and the offense. And I was watching him and I was like, man, he's got he's got serious. He could he was catching pets. I never I don't watch them how they finish. I watch how they catch how they balance their movement. I was like, this kid is like like I was when I was maybe a 
then in my sophomore year, beginning of my junior year. And uh, except for I was meaner in the rattlesnake, I was a little bit tougher around the basket. And I was as big as he was, but I was always tough. Then I think I was bigger, stronger. But so that was a fact. So I, I was talking to them. Um, I talked to his dad and his mom, and, and and I just felt close to them. They're great people. And so I, uh, so we we stay in contact on WhatsApp, and we talk about. Uh, You'll have questions about how to do certain things or something that I, I noticed when I watch uh, practice. I, I had the uh, coach behind me gave me access to watch practice game film. And I would look at that. Uh, I mean, practice film, practice films. And then I would and then I would tell Jesse stuff that I noticed, like things like always keep your hands up above your shoulders when you're in the paint uh, or something that that or something that I had a problem with. I would I'd immediately tell him first. I would tell his dad. His dad's like, why don't you just tell Jesse? So we started texting back and forth about things to work on um, uh, because the coaching staff at Syracuse with, with the big guys, they, they're putting them through the paces. The only thing that it's very easy to fine tune what somebody else is doing. And that's all because I, I did it. My, I did it my whole life. So I can notice he does he has a, all centers have certain kind of problems that, that, that are easy for me to fix. And that's how it all started. And that's how it moved ahead. And I'm, I met with him this summer. We had lunch and, um, at Cracker Barrel, and uh, uh, and um, his brother Kai was in town, so we all came over. We sat around, we laughed, and talked. Uh, I wanted to get him out fishing a little bit more, but we only went fishing once. I was doing um, an exhibition at the uh, at Auburn at the Bass Pro Shop, and Jesse came out there, and we let him catch a few fish, though you know. But uh, it, it was good. It's good to talk to him because he's like a sponge. It's one thing to talk to somebody and they just nod their head, but there's it's, it's another thing when somebody's trying to learn something, they're like a sponge. And that's that's the way he's always been. What kind of season do you think he's going to have? Listen, I think Jesse will have the kind of season. See, it, it's kind of funny because when, when I talked to him, I was like, it's you've got to work hard. I said, you don't have to be uh, mean or, or nasty because if you're intense and aggressive, a seven-foot guy doing that is really scary. So you don't have to be mean and nasty and scare people. If you're just intense and 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 and, and work to get the game like that, and if, if he does it that way, me personally, the the way the season went last year, you know, it was it was a losing season. But when he got hurt, there were the team was 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 moving upwards, and I still I felt they were in a they were in a prime position to, to do well in the postseason. And when he broke his hand, it just it, it just broke my heart because I felt that. Two things. I felt that had he continued to play that way, he might not have been here this year. I th he might have got drafted last year because the NBA drafts, drafts big men for two reasons, because they're developed or because they want to develop them. Hmm. And at that particular time, he was – that's all – I don't know if he was the, the most improved player in the ACC, but that's all I ever heard about when you watch a game. Oh, this is just – he's improved so much from that. So – he was on the radar for that. So I was a little, I was holding my breath because I felt that they were going to like snatch him away and, and give him like some intense, you know, stuff working on, working on his game as a big man. All of that to say he will be as good as he wants to be. He's got to put the time in. He knows he's got to put that time in. Um, they had a hiccup the other day, but uh, that's what the preseason's for. My old saying is the best thing about men is testosterone. The worst thing about men is testosterone. <laughs> you, you can't get them to do what you want them to do until their butt hits the ground, <laughs> until what they're trying to do doesn't work. And I'm pretty sure getting beat by cold day was not what everybody had planned. Mm -hmm. And it's one. It's amazing. The, the thing that happens after that happens when you lose <laughs> something like that, it's amazing how you start listening to everything that everybody <laughs> tells you in practice and you start paying attention. Like, you really must know what they're talking about because, <laughs> you know, but I'm 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 very excited. I'm very excited for him. I'm very excited for the team because it. I've always thought Coach Beheim doesn't he doesn't make stars. He creates opportunities for people to step in and, and to excel. Hmm. And so I, I get excited because I want to see who that person is. There's no they they're, they're finding their identity right now. Somebody's going to step into that spot and he's going to be accepted as that leader. And then that's when things are going to take off. So I always like to watch the before and after and, and see when that particular. When the light goes out, like when the light went out for Jesse uh, last year, 
and he started putting together these games. That's that's so so fulfilling to see a young kid realize what, what the potential they has, and then there's no stopping. Then it's like it's like a snowball rolling downhill. They, they see that I put this hard work in. I'm starting to play better. If I work harder, I'll start playing better. So it's uh, and it's just exciting for me because it's something that I witnessed, I went through, and that I did. And uh, so I'm I'm really excited to see how and how the team has got to figure out how to play together with him because with him. An inside outside game without an inside outside game, you're shooting 30 footers. With an inside, if you just let the big man touch the ball, everybody, whether it's a good big man or not, watch what happens when you pass the ball to the center. Everybody, like, it's like a magnet. And with the shooters, and it, we have one guy that can shoot from 35 feet. You have probably four guys that can shoot from 20 feet. And that's what happens. They suck them all in, he takes it, and he can pass the ball. He will pass it out. I mean, I uh, Dale Shockford would tell you that I never passed the ball, but I do remember I had three assists my senior year. Three. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the story behind that is this: I said, I said to them, I said, "Listen, I don't mind if you shoot. If you're going to shoot, let me know so I can go on the opposite side to rebound. But if you pass the ball to me and I'm five feet from the basket." It doesn't make sense to me to pass a five foot shot up for a fifteen foot shot or a twenty foot <laughs> shot. But if you can shoot it, go ahead and shoot it. But if you pass it to me, I can pretty much assure you that I'm gonna find a way to get it to the basket. So that was our little joke. Well, Roosevelt, this has been a pleasure and I could talk to you forever and, and listen to your stories. We'll have to have you on again sometime. Uh, but I appreciate you joining us here today. Brought to you by Kraus Health, the official partner of Syracuse Athletics, providing the latest technology and expertise in the treatment of stroke and cardiac emergencies.